The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Thank you. Welcome to West to Worship at West Raleigh Presbyterian Church on this Transfiguration Sunday. It is good and right that we are here and continuing to gather in this holy place, this sanctuary of our Lord. As always, we want to start with an expansive welcome, remembering that God has welcomed us home here into this place and that we then welcome one another. We extend a special welcome to any visitors, whether you're worshiping with us for the first time or continuing to discern your place in this family of faith. We're really glad and grateful that you are here. We also want to say a welcome to anyone who is visiting with us online. We are really grateful for this extended and expanded community of faith and for the way that it allows um, more people to connect into the life of this congregation. So if you are with us online, we're glad that you are here. Whether you're online or in the sanctuary, there are visitors, our, our friendship registers on the inside aisle of each pew. If you're here in the sanctuary, if you're worshiping online, they're in the drop-down menu just under the bulletin. Um, I do invite you to make a connection that way. Hopefully, uh, as we fill those out, pass them back down to the center, we'll get to know one another by name and um, over time by story as we are written into God's great and grand and today transformative and transfiguring story. This is um, the uh, season that moves us from Epiphany, which we have been in uh, since early January, into the season of Lent, which begins on Wednesday with Ash Wednesday. We will gather here in the sanctuary Wednesday evening for a service of ashes and of communion um, as we begin to mark this holy season together. Earlier that day on Wednesday, we'll be beginning a book, a book study at the noon hour. You can find information on that book study uh, on the back of your bulletin. We're going to be doing a book this Lent um, by author Paul. Mark, are you in the house right now? Is it, yeah, is it Gal Galbraith, we, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then author is going to be with us on Monday as we begin that session. The Zoom link will come out Mon uh, Wednesday morning along with um, an invitation to join in that book study. So um, we're looking forward to starting, uh, to beginning that, beginning the season of Lent that way as well. Also on Wednesday morning, you will notice the first um, of a series of um, seeking questions and prayer that will be coming to your email inbox each day. That will those those will come daily from Ash Wednesday all the way through um, Holy Week. So I invite you to look for those and mark them. If you don't see them, check out your spam. Move them to your inbox so that you can continue to get those um, as the season of Lent unfolds before us. Any other announcements? I think that's yeah. Let us turn our hearts and our minds to the worship of Almighty God. Come my way, my truth, my life, such a way as gives us bread, such a truth angels such a light as Come my light, my feast, my strength, such a light as shows a feast, such a Feast as man's in land, such a strength as man's is Such a love. 
Let us be called to worship, standing in body or in spirit. The day has dawned, the morning star rises. God speaks in cloud and flame, in mystery, visions, and dreams. The Lord loves justice and equity. God is with us and God for all people. Let all the people praise the Lord. As Catherine noted, we had been traveling in the season of Epiphany, following the light of the Epiphany star, revealing to us the ways of Christ's justice and compassion. When we gather for worship, we rejoice and we begin our praise, but part of that is recognizing who we are and the ways that we want to be and how we strive to live in that light. And so we confess our brokenness and our sin, not only for ourselves, but for one another. We are a communal people who recognize that who we are. Let us pray together. God of compassion, in Jesus Christ, we behold you transforming light, yet we continue to live in the shadows. Preoccupied with ourselves, we fail to see your work in the world. We speak when we should listen, we act when we should reflect. Empower us to live in your light and to walk in your ways for the sake of him who is the light of the world, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. The grace of God is poured out for us upon us, immersing us in what is good and what is hopeful. We live in the light, and we need not be fearful of being squelched or rejected. We live into the peace that comes to us because we are people who have been redeemed. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>
Friends, you may be seated as our young Christians come forward. Good morning for a few minutes, a few minutes of time together. Good morning, everybody. Hey, Millie, welcome back. It's good to see you. Phoebe and Colette and the Kate. Good morning. The Lord be with you. Thank you. Thank you. So this morning, we are celebrating transfiguration. It's one of those big churchy words. Can you say transfiguration? Transfiguration. Yeah. It's a story about a time that Jesus made a change. But I actually want to think about connecting the dots. Have you done those um, activities in school or in coloring books or workbooks where that you connect the dots by numbers, you go from one to two to three to four to five, and by the time you connect all the dots, what happens? It becomes a picture. That's right, that's right. And the story of Jesus is kind of like that. The story of God made known in Jesus is like that. No one story can tell us all about Jesus. So we have to connect the dots of a lot of different stories. So the story at Christmas, tell me a little bit about what happens at Christmas. It's Jesus' birthday. That's right. One of the big churchy words that we often use is Emmanuel, God who we can't see, who's in spirit all the time, all the way around us, is born in the person of Jesus, right, is born of Mary in the person of Jesus. So God, the first God, is born in Jesus. And that's like the first dot, one of the dots. Then today's connect the dots is transfiguration. So now Jesus has grown up. He is a man. He's got 12 disciples that are following him, learning from him, watching him um, heal and teach and preach and he says we're going to go up to a mountain up a mountain together and so three of those disciples James and Peter and John they hike up a mountain have you hiked up a mountain before yeah who's who's hiked up a mountain Phoebe have you gone hiking before no it's really a fun cool experience when you're in like at the bottom of the mountain in the parking lot are there sometimes a lot of people, like there's cars that have all driven to the foot of the mountain. And then as you hike up the mountain, as you get up towards the top, you get more and more alone, right? The people are kind of spread out. Um, some people it takes longer. Some people get there faster. So there's fewer people by the time you get to the top of the mountain. So by the time they get to the top of the mountain, it's just Jesus and James and John and Peter. And all of a sudden, Jesus changes. He becomes a dazzling, like light-like figure. All of his clothes become this dazzling white. And he's like, it's like this superhero kind of moment where all of a sudden, he's not just like flesh and bones like me and you. He's like God, dazzling right there in front of their eyes. Can you imagine? It's kind of hard to imagine. What do you think you might feel like if all of a sudden your friend at the top of this mountain kind of changes, transforms into this dazzling superhero-like figure? What do you think you'd feel? Good, yes. My heart would kind of leap. I'd be like, wow, this is really a cool and amazing moment. What else might you feel? Surprised for sure. Like, oh, I was not expecting this. And a little bit scared. What does this mean? Yeah, Jesus, who we've known as this friend and this person and they knew he was the Messiah, but they didn't really understand what that meant. All of a sudden, whew, 
there's something different about him, and they can see it. They felt joy and surprise and curiosity and a little bit afraid. That's right. And so then Jesus goes, turns back into his normal self, and guess what happens? They go down the mountain. Like, literally, that's kind of the end of the story for today. They go down the mountain. (laughs) And the funny thing about this story that I just always think about every year is they go down the mountain, and you know what? They had this crazy experience of joy and surprise and a little bit of fear, and they go down the mountain, and nothing about their lives has changed. But you know what they have done? They've connected another dot, right? Right? Jesus is God in human form, and now they've seen their friend be a little bit more God-like form, right? And so just like Colette said, they've connected those dots to be able to understand a little bit more about who Jesus is. Now, Do you think, when you have one of those really big experiences, do you just forget it automatically? Kind of remember it, right? It's one of those things that once you see it, you can't unsee it. So even though the world didn't change, they had been changed because now they knew something about Jesus that they didn't know before. They knew a superpower about him that they hadn't quite understood before. And you know what's really amazing? That same Jesus, who's both baby and teacher and preacher and God, is still with all of us too. And we may never connect all those dots completely, but with each of these stories, we get to know a little bit more about who God is. It's pretty amazing. Shall we say a prayer together before you all go? And you've got a special lesson today. It's a new lesson that nobody has heard yet about a man named Paul. So I'm excited for you in children's worship today. All right. Tell you what, today let's try this. I'm going to say one line of the prayer, and then we'll invite you all to say that line after me. So I will say, dear Jesus, and then y'all will say, dear Jesus. Okay. Let's close our eyes just because that helps us. Focus a little bit better, and then we'll say, Dear Jesus, it is amazing that you are God, born of Mary. You are a child just like us, and it is amazing that you also dazzle like God. We thank you for this is exciting. It's a surprise and we're still trying to understand it. Day by day, help us put the pieces of your enormous love together. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. I'll see y'all in just a little bit. I believe that Miss Allison is going to take you down to children's worship. And I am very stealthily, no, you're good, Lauren. I'm very stealthily going to move the communion basket here for a little bit later in worship. Let us pray. Ancient of days, clothed in majesty and splendor, your voice makes the earth tremble in wonder. Overshadow us with your spirit so that we may hear your word and live as your faithful disciples and covenant people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whom we glimpse your glory. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 24. 
Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandments which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us, until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The word of the Lord. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel of Matthew. It is Matthew's telling of the transfiguration, a story that um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell. So here again what the Spirit has to say to the church. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became a dazzling white. And suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly, A bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my Son, the Beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, Elijah is indeed coming and will restore all things, but I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him. But they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that Jesus was speaking to them about John the Baptist. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Drew and I just finished the first season of Ted Lasso. Yes, we are a little bit behind. We're late coming to the party, I know. But we didn't add Apple TV to our menu of streaming options until recently. And full disclosure, we did it mainly so that we could watch Ted Lasso. So how many folks here are fans of Coach Lasso? Raise your hand. I won't ask the one among us who's actually wearing a Ted Lasso sweater to stand, but there is someone here. For those of you who do not know the show, um, it's a feel-good comedy about an American football coach who takes a job as the coach of a fictional British soccer team, the AFC Richmond. He knows very, very, very little about the actual game of football, what we in America call soccer. He also doesn't know that he has been hired at least initially with the secret intention that his inexperience will will lead to failure. But what Coach Lasso lacks in knowledge of soccer, 
and support to succeed, he more than makes up for in his approach to life and the art of coaching. So he just barrels into this first season with the optimism of those who believe that they can do anything and change the world. He builds his team by building up his players. He tends to their needs. He gets the showers fixed. He learns where they came from, the stories they bring with them to AFC Richmond, as well as the gifts that they bring to the team. He wants to know the contours of their growing edges so that he can help them grow as people and as players. He puts this great big yellow handmade slightly cattywampus sign up above the door to the coach's office that says, believe. That sign, among many other public displays of optimism, only gets Coach Ted Lasso eye rolls and foul language. However, he persists. And little by little, with all of its ups and downs, the team finally comes together. Even so, they have a disastrous first season. So much so that they are one loss away from losing their place in the Premier League, which would relegate them to the Championship League, something that's really confounding to Coach Lasso. But something I'm told is similar to a Major League Baseball player getting relegated to a minor league team. Except this applies not just to the player, but to the whole organization. Everyone except Ted Lasso agrees there is no way they can win the final game against the best team, arguably the best team in the league. Undeterred, Coach Lasso has them compile and learn a whole playbook full of trick plays that are meant to surprise and stun their opponent. And it works. Late in the second half, Richmond scores to tie the game which by this time in that game, they know a tie is all that they need to keep their place in the Premier League. They are elated. The vision of what is possible is immediately transformed. The stadium goes wild. The camera pans to fans all over the world who are watching this game who just erupt. They are completely lost in what they believe is their game-changing moment even if it is a tie. But before the whistle blows, the other team takes the ball, runs down the pitch, and scores. The whole world deflates or combusts, depending on which room you're in. Some are furious that they seem to have lost what almost was. Others are heartbroken at what could have been. Still others are confused at how all of this could have happened so fast. Either way, it is official. What seemed to have been inevitable, the end of Coach Lasso's first season, AMC Richmond will indeed be relegated. Jesus' followers had been so optimistic. Having been pulled out of their ordinary lives of fishing and trading, they had been gathered together by Jesus. They heard him challenge a world order that seemed so intractable, but yet they watched as religious and political leaders took note. Having read the scriptures their whole lives, they listened deeply as he interpreted them in a way that was not really new, but somehow brought them new life. They followed Jesus, and they watched as he put flesh and blood on his message, healing the sick, casting out demons, calling into community those who had been left out and left behind. Something real was happening and changing before their very eyes. And then, just six days before they went up this mountain, Jesus had kind of changed the questions and changed the tone in the room. He had asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? Peter had answered, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say you might be one of the other prophets. Jesus said, okay, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, as Peter always does, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. 
And then Jesus affirms that and he goes on to say, yes, Peter, and you will be the rock, the rock on which I will build my church. By the time they had reached this point in the journey, the disciples had come to believe. They had come to believe that all of this was more than just an impossible dream. They had begun to believe that Jesus was the Messiah and that there was to be a new community built on his grace and his love and this new vision for the world. They began to believe that God's unfolding story had not stopped with those prophets of old, to believe that God was indeed doing another new thing. And they were beginning to see that their lives were being written into this still developing story as they connected those dots, trying to understand where they were in that story. But there was this one part, this one dot that they just couldn't yet write in. For among these glimpses into the future, among these flash forwards of what could be, these dots to be connected, the disciples had to first understand a truth that was much harder to suffer. Before any of this, Jesus said, he would undergo great death and suffering and be raised again on the third day. Additionally, Jesus told his disciples in the days just leading up to the transfiguration, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will find it. Six days later, our story begins. It's sort of halftime in Jesus' ministry. And Matthew tells us that Jesus took Peter and James and John up the mountain all by themselves. Once they arrive, Jesus is transfigured before them. What Matthew describes is more like Harry Potter or Star Wars than real life. Jesus' face begins to shine like the sun, his clothes dazzle. He's joined by Moses and by Elijah, signaling to the disciples that something extraordinary is indeed happening. Now, Peter's often criticized for what comes next, but I think we would do better to reserve judgment and go back to the scriptures for insight. Peter knows the story of God. And remember the story, the part of what Alec read a few minutes ago, when Moses goes up to the mountain all those years ago, he stayed for 40 days and for 40 nights. It took time to receive the Ten Commandments and all of those special instructions and laws about how to shape their common life. Those commandments that Moses received over a long period of time later would be carried in the Ark of the Covenant and that Ark of the Covenant was kept in a tent that came to be called the tabernacle, the place where God dwells. So Peter offers to build three shelters, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he recognized this as a place where God dwells. But before Jesus can answer Peter, God speaks they are overcome with a bright cloud from which a voice says, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And Peter and James and John realize that the God who had traveled with Israel for generations in the law, in the tent, in the tabernacle, was now present with them in Jesus. Can you imagine this moment of revelation? The children nailed it, right? Joy and confusion and fear. Their understanding and their vision for what was possible was transformed, and with it came elation and confusion and maybe more than a little bit of fear. Luther Seminary professor Joy J. Moore says it this way, everything that they were expecting is turned upside down to give them exactly what was promised. This is a revelation that comes not from what they know, 
but from what God reveals. So then they go down the mountain. Peter and James and John, and they keep connecting all of these dots, which then in turn gives them a better picture of the future and their place within it. Jesus tells them, though, that they are not to tell anyone what they have seen or heard until after he had been raised from the dead. So curious, the disciples continue or start to ask Jesus questions about Elijah, who they had just seen on the mountain with Moses. The scribes say that Elijah must come first, the disciples say, and Jesus agrees, yes, that is how the story untolds. However, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him and they have done with him as they pleased. Another dot connected in the disciples' imagination. Oh, John the Baptist is the one who has come to prepare the way. Jesus is the Messiah, the one who will suffer before being raised in glory, and another piece falls into place. They've now seen enough to believe that they are actually in the middle of a story that is continuing to unfold around them. The past and the future, all part of this moment now. The transfiguration, this extraordinary moment, was not going to change their experience of what would happen when they got down the, mo the mountain. Jesus would continue to challenge the powerful political and religious institutions that would ultimately conspire to kill him. But even so, they had been to the mountain, and you cannot unsee and unknow what you have seen. They had seen what was possible. God was walking with them in person in Jesus. And even though they knew that would not change the future for him or for them, it did, un it did transform the way they understood the future and their place in it. So back to Ted Lasso. In the last scenes of the last episode of season one, Coach Lasso appears in the locker room after that lost game. And he gives an important and poignant post-game talk. He acknowledges that they may not have won, but they had definitely succeeded. And he looks around the room and he, he calls out the goalie who he says made more saves than a Baptist preacher. He looks at Roy Kemp, the retiring soccer legend who is very sensitive about his age. And he says, Roy chased down his grandson, stopped him from getting an easy one. And then he goes on to acknowledge how painful the loss. It is. And there's nothing to undo or rewrite that. It's a sad moment. And there's nothing they can do to take away that sadness. However, he says... Lift up your heads and look around this locker room. Look around. It's not a locker room, but work with me. I want you to be grateful that you are not going through this sad moment alone. You're going through it with all of these other people. We're going to be sad first. We're going to be angry first, he says. But then we're going to go onward. We're going to go forward together. A little bit later in the day, Ted goes into the team owner's office. Her name is Rebecca, and he's been visiting her office daily. And this time he goes ready to offer his resignation after this season where they have been relegated, which she then in turn does not accept. Instead, she tells him, you, Coach Lasso, are not going anywhere because we have work to do next season. You can see the relief and the joy creep back into his face. Now remember, he knows very little about this game. Something sometimes we often feel about life, right? So then he asks, so the team that get, a team that gets relegated, they can get unrelegated, Right? They can get promoted, Rebecca answers. 
So then next year, he says, we get ourselves a promotion. And then we come back to this league and we do something that no one believes we could ever do. I'm told that in Haiti, they have a saying, there are mountains beyond mountains. And the season may be over, but there is a season too. And the quest continues. And once they get down the mountain, there will be other mountains to climb. But they will climb each and every one with a different perspective on what is not only possible, but the one who goes with them. And what is inevitable has been transformed and will continue to rise among them, transforming their lives. And so they look around at who goes with them and they keep going onward, forward, together. Amen. Amen, and please be seated. Last Sunday, we had the opportunity to hear from Cheryl Williams about the Turner House and our neighbors at Oberlin Village. Today, we take up a special offering along with our tithes and offerings to be good neighbors and friends and allies as we continue to hold both the heritage and the future of the stories of Turner House and the community so very near us. The baskets are going to be located both at the back of the sanctuary and now here, which is why Catherine stealthily moved the, the one basket, so that when you come for communion in just a few moments, you have an opportunity to place your offerings um, in, in those baskets to be collected up and shared as we share the good news of our friendship in Christ.
Friends, there are mountains beyond mountains, and yet we are fed and we are sustained by the one who transforms the impossible into possible and promises to walk with us and to create a community that may walk together. Friends, this is the Lord's table. It is here to sustain us to remind us of our salvation and of our liberation, to remind us that we do not go alone. This is not West Raleigh's table. It's not a Presbyterian table. It is the Lord's table. And the Lord all invites, the Lord invites all who come in joy, who come in a little bit of confusion, maybe even those who come in fear, to come and know that you too can and will be sustained. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of Moses and Elijah, you come to us in a whirlwind of mystery, a swirling tempest, a dev devouring fire, yet you come to us, speaking faithfulness and mercy, shining light in our darkness, offering forgiveness for our sin. We give you thanks for Jesus, the light of the world, shining at the dawn of creation, shining in our hearts this day with a splendor that overshadows all the beauty of heaven and earth. In his face, we have seen your glory. Through his words, we have heard your truth. By his living and dying and rising, we have come to know the height and breadth and depth of your great love. 
With thanksgiving, we remember the bread of life taken, blessed, broken, and given, that we might be holy and whole. With thanksgiving, we remember the cup of salvation, your new covenant of grace poured out in love for the world. Remembering your faithfulness and mercy as we share this bread and cup, we offer ourselves in your service through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now let us share in your Holy Spirit, poured out in this place for these people upon this bread and this cup. In your spirit, make us one people, one in the promise of Moses, one in the prophecy of Elijah, one in the body of Christ, as we seek to proclaim the good news. Yet our lives shine with Christ's light, a blessing of joy to the living, a beacon of hope to the dying, a sign of your new creation. All of this we pray to you, O God, through the gift of your spirit and in the grace of your word, to the glory of your holy name. Here are the voices as we pray together. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The elders come forward.
Has everyone been fed? Will all who are able please stand and let us join our voices again in prayer. We give you thanks, O God, for here at your table you have transformed us from individuals into the body of Christ. Make us strong for your service that we may be messengers of your reconciling love and light for all people. Amen. Thank you. Disciples of Christ, go out into the world in peace. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor and serve all people rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessings of God, the Creator, and the Redeemer, and the Sustainer be with you and everyone who is dear to you, and with those who are known and dear only to the heart of God. Friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And all God's people, for the last time for a little while, say, Alleluia and Amen.